Good morning. Good morning. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I know it. Pastor, it's five minutes early. Uh, that's right. It is five minutes early. I'm doing this for a reason. That will give me a chance to speak with some of you and see some of you that I have not uh, seen yet. So this will give us just an informal moment for a few moments before we get started and mm, get this coffee. And so I thank the Lord for you, uh, especially to all of the members of New Hebron, uh, to my family, uh, my extended church family, uh, biological in-laws alike. We appreciate you and uh, your support and your prayers and the passing uh, of my wife of over 24 years. Uh, she lived a full, rich, beautiful life that touched uh, many people. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you. The cards, the flowers, the prayers, the hugs, the kisses, the gifts, not just for me, but for my children. Uh, to all the other members of my family, I'm sure you've given them love as well. So thank you so much. But but while I got you, we ain't started preaching yet. We can get this coffee. So somebody put on there what kind of coffee you're drinking this morning. I, I've gone to old school Folgers. That's a staple in this time. You can't mess with that. Hope everyone has a wonderful Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, a day to look back and to commemorate uh, what Christ did in dying, and yet early he rose for our salvation, showing his divinity, showing his power. Just take a trip back down memory lane. You remember the old Easter egg hunts that we would have around the church, and somebody would hide eggs, and some of the kids sometime halfway get to fighting. Or who gonna get the last one and who get the most one? And sometimes you remember that plastic egg. Somebody put a few dollars in there. That's the one that you really wanted to find. And boy, can't you remember those days running around the church house having fun like that? And it's memories like that that some people that may not have been affiliated with the church in their youth for whatever reason they they just don't have it. Uh, so the Tim Folgers will work. Yes, it will. Uh, Maxwell House will too. But I tell you what, when the barrel get low, I'll take some cheap coffee as well. But uh, how many of y'all out there drink your coffee black? Am I the only one? Y'all look at that there. Ain't nothing in that coffee. Ain't nothing in that coffee. Look at that coffee right there. Nothing in the world is in that. I'm going to tell you. Now, I just have to say this. For those of you who put in cream and sugar and milk and honey and everything, else, you don't like coffee. You need to be drinking cocoa. But when you get some water, some hot water, and some coffee grounds, hey, y'all y'all gonna make me say something. That's that's coffee right there. <laughs> Boy, I love you and I miss you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. <laughs> I see you, Sister Tim. Sister Ashley Brown, I see you. I hope you got your coffee. We know you can get grumpy without it. <laughs> I'm teasing. And let me give a special thank you just on this morning. I was in the back messing around. I had my front door open, the door locked. Came back and had a gift at the front door. And uh, Sister Cheryl Brown thought enough about me and my family on this morning. She brought over some, some coffee and donuts. Sister Brown, thank you for thinking of us. We appreciate you. And you don't, people don't have to do anything for you. And I tell you, we have just been excited. Uh, I know myself, I have. Uh, things are different. Uh, things are altered our life in so many ways because of the loss will forever be changed but there is a man by the name of Jesus that earth has no hurt that he can't heal and so I thank you and I want to encourage you all to keep praying for us just because we had the celebration of life on Friday does not mean the prayers have to stop and I want to be reminded to do the same for all of you and so, uh, Sister Sherry James, uh, good to see you. Sister Tamia Tim, Sister Mary Joyner, God bless you. Sister Nia James, Brother Larry Howe, we thank the Lord for you. We thank the Lord for all of you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stay with the time. It's almost 1045. We're going to have a prayer. And I have a sneaky suspicion. I will bet that every last one of you pretty much know on an Easter Sunday morning, 
the general thrust direction topic of the sermon today. I know it. I'm, I'm not going to fool you. I don't think it's going to catch you by surprise. We're not talking about tithing this morning. Uh, we're not talking about husbands love your wife. We're going to talk about Jesus as we do every Sunday, but we're certainly going to look at the resurrection and the events surrounding the resurrection. Sister Verdis Davis, I see you too. So it's 1045. If you guys don't mind, get your Bibles. We're going to be in John chapter 18. But before we go there, we want to ask God for his guidance. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for another chance just to behold your glory, to see a brand new day with the rising of the new sun over the fingertips of the trees. With every new day, you give us new mercy. Father, we ask you to help us find understanding in scripture. Help us to live and be obedient to that which we have been taught and we learn. And we pray, Lord, that you can be with us in this moment. And more importantly, Father, help us to stay with you, to be obedient in these last and evil days. God, we ask you this in the name of Jesus. Let every heart say amen. Amen. John chapter 18. Uh, people, uh, as we turn there, John chapter 18, we're going to look at verse 10. I see CM sister is watching. God bless you. My sister also, Crystal Bland, Sister Morris, Brother Leon Deloach. Don't be mad at me. You know what I'm talking about, Brother Deloach. Uh, but people, let me say this to you. Uh, these are some wonderful times, unique times. But one thing that I have noticed practically, and I want you all to just keep this in your mind. There's nothing definite going on at this point. But have you noticed that when we are stripped because of our circumstance of all of the trimmings that we kind of add in worship? Not that they're bad now, but, you know, we don't have four, five, six songs. Uh, the offering is given via online or maybe some have taken it to the church. We have people there. Uh, we don't have the announcements, things of that nature. Uh, we still have prayer, not an altar prayer. I think that's always in order to pray. But when you just strip down to, you say a prayer, you have the Bible. That's really the core of worship service. And I've just been thinking to myself, just practically, I'm not saying we're going to make some changes. I'm not trying to implement any difference when things lift and we're able to get back to church. But it, do, it, it, it does kind of bring to mind when you just get down to the basics. It, it seems like when we're done, it almost feels like a whole extra day we have. It's not 1245 and we're in the parking lot talking and we leave at 115. When we're done, it's virtually 1115, 1120. And depending on the circumstances, some people go in the living room or kitchen or a bedroom or some may run errands and so I have just noticed the change because I am and maybe many of you are so accustomed to the structure that we are so been kind of uh, um, uh, involved in for so many years it's just it's just different I don't know not not bad not good it's just different and I kind of I kind of like it but I just like we get right to the Bible we, we, we get straight to it and so let's look at John chapter 18. We're going to look at verse 10. I want to ask you, please follow in your Bible. Of course, you know my saying, context, context, context. We will not just stay with verse 10. You know we are going to have to make sure that we look at the preceding verses to put it in context. John chapter 18, the verse is 10. Then Simon Peter having a sword, drew it and smote, that is struck or hit or cut the high priest servant. And he was successful in his attempt and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Of course, Jesus in the next verse said, put away your sword. Put it in the sheath. Put it up. Then Simon Peter. He wasn't a trained swordsman. He was a fisherman. But he had a sword. 
And he cut the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now we're going to look at how Jesus responded before and after this verse. This is Christ. And uh, our topic we're going to use is Jesus is the master of the moment. Amen, somebody. Jesus is the master of the moment. And, and, and I want to kind of put us in the mindset of the context of not just the writing of John, but this particular chapter itself. Because here, many of us are familiar, Christ is on his way to the cross. Uh, it won't be long before he is captured, criticized, and crucified. Uh, and in these final moments, when the pressure is on, we don't find him shrinking from the task or cowering away at the moment. But yet he's still standing tall doing the work, the redemptive work that his heavenly father has laid out for him to carry out. And one thing that we should look at in our own selves is that when a tough time hits, uh, when a crisis hits, the only thing you have during a crisis is your conduct in that crisis. In other words, when pressure builds up on you, it exposes what's underneath the hood. Whether it be the pressure of a death, the pressure of financial loss, the pressure of sickness, the pressure of a job loss, the pressure that comes from a tumultuous home, whenever that pressure is on you, it exposes who you really are in Christ and who you are not in Christ. You may have thought that you wouldn't use four letter words anymore, but when that pressure got on you, you find yourself saying things that once you get past it, you kind of regret. It's kind of like those times when you wake up in the morning you're rushing, you woke up late, you can't find your keys and you go to the bathroom and you got to brush your teeth before you jump on the road and traffic and 6.30 is going to be busy and packed and you look at that toothpaste, it says flat as a door. So what do you do? You squeeze it and you squeeze it and you squeeze it. You, you, you roll it up, you, 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 you use both your fingers and put enough pressure on it and when you squeeze it enough, whatever's in there is going to come out. I still remember the story when I was at Booker T. Washington. I was fifth grade and I was running, playing it with one of my friends and he hit me and I tripped and fell and I said a, a bad word right in front of the teacher's aide. And when he took that pencil out and wrote my name on a tablet, I can still remember he was a tall man with an afro with some gray in it. I knew what was going to happen. The teacher's aide, turns my name into the teacher. The teacher sends home a behavior document to my mother. The behavior document must be signed by my mother. And if you don't know my mother, Linda Bland, she can give a good whooping. So my friends tried to help me get out of trouble. He didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. And I'll never forget the words he said as a little 11, 12 year old fifth grader. He said, if it wasn't on your heart, you never would have said it in the first place. That comes to mind what the Bible said. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Whatever's in the well is going to come up in the bucket. How do we know what's on our heart? How do we know who we really are in Christ? When the pressure mounts on you, whatever's in you is going to come out. And here we see Jesus in John chapter 18 and let's look at our Bibles in the last moments of his life. In verse one, Jesus had finished speaking and he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where there was a garden that he entered him and his disciples. The brook Kedron, it's a small little brook. It's not wide at all. 
As a matter of fact, it doesn't even always have water in it. The only time the Brook Kidron will have water is after it rains or during the fall and the winter, which they would consider the rainy season. Other parts of the year, the Brook Kedron is dry. The Brook Kedron has significance even in the Old Testament. It's spelled differently in the Old Testament. It's spelled with a K, K-I-D. Here we see it in verse 1 of John chapter 18 with a C, C-E-D, but it's referring to the same body or channel of water. It was across the book, uh, the brook Kedron in the Old Testament, 2, Timothy, 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. David's feet ran across it as he was on his way, hiding from his own son, Absalom, his own son, tried to usurp the authority of the kingdom from his daddy, stole the kingdom from it, made his father David run off across the book Kedron to find safety in the wilderness. And this time of year in Jerusalem, I'm saying this time, during the events of John 18, here it's Passover time. And the brook Kedron is probably stained with the blood of many sacrificial lambs. Because on the mountainside, they would take out the sheep and the lambs and they would cut their throats to kill them as Passover lambs. And that blood would run down the mountainside and it would fill the brook Kedron. And here we have the Lamb of God walking over the brook Kedron, going into a garden. A garden that probably belonged to one of Jesus' friends. And it says in verse two, and Judas also, which betrayed him, he's the betrayer of Jesus. He knew the place. Why? I'm going to paraphrase the end of that verse, because oftentimes Jesus would go there for prayer. Judas has sold out Christ for a few pieces of silver. And Judas now has the task of bringing the enemies of Christ to where Jesus is to arrest him. So Judas is thinking, where can I find Christ at a moment like this? I know he likes to pray and I know there's a place he prefers to pray. Let's go to this garden, the garden of Gethsemane. And I bet you we can find Jesus at that place. Judas, because he has had three and a half years of intimacy, privacy, personal time spent with Jesus. He uses this personal information that he has gained from being around Jesus. He uses it against Jesus to bring his enemies into his presence, to arrest him, to criticize him, to betray him, and to eventually crucify him. Now let's make an application right here, people, from what this says. Judas was at least externally, claiming to be a friend of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. But we know he never really was one of his. But what he does is he has been in the circle of Jesus and now he's using private information to bring Jesus down. Listen to me, people. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful, this isn't just for young folks, who you call a friend. Because everybody that's by your side is not on your side. People will tell you, I'm 100% behind you. But when trouble comes, you'll find out that they're 100 feet behind you. Well, how do you know who's a friend and who's not? Who will betray me and who's not? Listen to how the people around you Talk about other people. If there are people in your social circle, this could be family and friends alike. If you have people in your social circle and all they do is talk about folk, criticize folk, malign folks' character, bring them down. Don't think that you are so close to them that they wouldn't do it to you. They're only giving you a bird's eye view. They're only giving you a VIP seat. Here's how I'm going to treat you when I'm mad at you. In other words, you're looking down the scope with them now. You'll be looking down the barrel against them later. 
Everybody that's in your face is not your friend. Judas takes this personal information and uses it to betray Jesus. Now we're gonna make another application. We're gonna stay with the Bible now. Judas used this information. He knew the place where Christ went to pray. Be careful about giving people personal information about you, especially when they show you their character is ungodly. Don't give people, don't give your pearls, the precious thing, to the swine, people who don't want Jesus or people who are not kind-hearted. Don't give people the pearl of your friendship. Don't give people the pearl even of biblical information. They don't want to know the Bible. They just want to argue. Don't give people the pearl of your private information because a time could come you could have a Judas in your camp. How many times have you prayed and confided in someone and you kind of knew in the back of your mind this is a cold-hearted person but they just happened to be around you at that time you told them about your medical status you 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 told them about what you're going through with your marriage you 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 told them about what you're going through with your children or with your spouse or with your sibling personal things that you just wouldn't want people to know and how many times have you been in that spot and that person that was supposed to be close to you they used that information when they got mad at you and they betrayed you. Friends, if it happened to Jesus, don't fool yourself and think that it can't happen to you. So we see in John chapter 18, we stand with the Bible in verse number three, Judas, he has now received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees they came thither, they came there, they went to the place, the Garden of Gethsemane, and they had lanterns and torches and weapons. Now the band of men, those are the Roman soldiers, probably came from Pilate's fortress. It's called the Fortress of Antonio. It was located in Jerusalem. The band of men, then you have the officers, the officers are the temple guards, the temple police. These would be lower class Roman soldiers that were in the temple to keep the peace and to keep down any obstruction. But if you compare scripture with scripture in Matthew's account, Matthew 26, and in Mark's account, Mark 14, it also said not only do you have a band of men and officers, there also was a great multitude of people possibly in the hundreds, that all came out with torches and lanterns and weapons against Christ. And who did they come out to get? It was Jesus and it was the 11. On one side, you've got officials from the Roman government. You've got officials from the temple. You've got a multitude of people. People just want to see what's going on. On the other side, You've got Jesus, who at least in the secular mind, claimed to be God. And you've got 11 others who think he's really the son of God, who he's divine. If you were to look at these two sides, you would say these 11 must be wrong. And the multitude, the majority, must be right. Friends, truth is not determined by majority rule. As a matter of fact, there's a majority of people who can vote on a certain thing in the land. There can be a majority of people who can even vote on something in the church. But truth is not left to be relative to what the majority of people believe. Truth is the rock solid truth from God's word. If it were me, Lord, I wish I could make this choice. I would rather be a part of the master's minority than to be a part of the majority that's going against Christ because the majority is wrong. Sometimes the group can be wrong just because everybody is doing it. Everybody's involved. It does not mean what's happening is right. And here we see all these people up against Jesus and from the outside 
it would look like Jesus is in the wrong. And look what they showed up with. Lanterns, torches, and weapons. When you're familiar with the time of year the Passover was held in, it was characterized by having a full moon. And I wish Deacon Gardner could be here to testify with me to when the full moon would come out at night. Sometime he would call me and say, look out there at that full moon and you can go out on your porch or go in the backyard. And if the street lights were out, the full moon can give plenty of natural light to illuminate the places where you are. So since there's a full moon, why did they have torches, lanterns, and weapons? Because most people, when they are confronted in a situation like this, where there's a multitude of people, you got Roman soldiers, Roman police, temple guards, and they're all coming out, this mob of people coming your way. Most people would run. But Jesus, who shows us he's not afraid, he, he doesn't shrink under the pressure of the moment. He knew that this is the reason why I came. This is supposed to happen. It says in verse four, Jesus Knowing all things that should come upon him, he still went forth and said, who are you looking for? Friends, he's the master of the moment. He was not afraid of the mobs. He was not afraid of the crowd. And that's something that we should be instructed by. You should not be afraid to go against the masses when you are right. It doesn't matter if people don't agree with you. If what you are doing is biblically based, if what you are doing is true in scripture, if you can find it in the Bible, this is why I handle my anger this way. This is why I raise my children this way. This is why I allow my husband, who's a godly man, to lead this home. This is why you love your wife like Christ loved the church. That don't mean you henpeck. This is what we do with our money. We honor God through tithing and offering. This is how we handle anger. We are angry, but we don't sin and we don't give place to the devil. This is why we can cry at a funeral when we hear the preacher say ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But we still don't sorrow as if there is no hope. Why? When the Bible says it, I don't care how many people come against it. You are a part of the master's minority. And in verse four, Jesus, he knew everything that was going to come upon him. He knew their intentions. He knew they were going to lie. He knew Judas were going to betray him. Fast forward. He knew they were going to have illegal trials to go from the religious trials to the civil trials, that he would be scourged and beaten and criticized and crucified. He knew it. He knew that they would say, give us Barabbas, a known murderer, but crucify Jesus. Even though he knew these things, pay attention to the text. He still went forth and asked them, who are you looking for? Even though he knew these things, listen to me, he still obeyed. Friend, brother and sister in Christ, can you obey when it hurts? Can you obey when it's unpopular? Can you obey when you're misunderstood? Can you obey when you lied on? Can you obey when people malign your character for doing what is right? Can you still stay the course and keep your hand to the plow or will you capitulate to the whims of the crowd and get away from what you know is right and to do what you know you shouldn't be doing? It's hard to be humble when you're being criticized for doing what is right. We had a situation, I'm going to say this, in our own church. A person had nestled in like a member and was sexually harassing the women of the church. Well, when I found out about it, guess what I did? I sat down with him privately, biblically, and sensibly. We had prayer. We went through the scripture. What you're doing is wrong. 
Stop it. But guess what happened? There was lies that were told. That young man left that meeting and said, the pastor kicked me out the church. Never come back. And there were some people that knew he was lying and they still carried the lie. So what am I to do? Uh, 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 go against what I know is right and say, well, come on back in for fear of criticism of people. But friends, when you know that you're right, when you know what you're doing is right, it don't matter what mob, what multitude is on the other side, you plus God will always be the majority. Because with him, all things are possible. And without him, you can do nothing. Jesus shows us he knew what they were going to do to him. But he still went forth and he said, who are you looking for? Well, they answer him plainly in verse number five. We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am he. If you have your Bibles, if you, if you have a, a King James version, and I've gone over this before, you know that the word he is italicized. You see, the, 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 the purpose of John's writing is to display the deity of Christ. And what Jesus did, he just declared his deity. Well, what do you mean? What Jesus said is, I am. The word he is italicized. The word he is put there in English to give a complete statement. They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, knowing what they're coming to do, he stepped forth and he said, I am. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. The same I am that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. The same I am that said, let there be and there was. The same I am that showed up in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Is the same I am that's in the garden of Gethsemane and they think that they're about to arrest him unwillingly. Jesus says, I am. He declares his deity. And then in verse six, he shows his power. As soon as he had said unto them, I am, says I am he in the King James Version. The literal rendering is I am. As soon as he said, I am. They went backwards and fell to the ground. This was not laying out prostrate to uh, worship him or to praise him. This was Jesus forcing them to take a step back and get down on one knee. Showing them that I am in complete control. Showing them that the events that are surrounding me right now are not outside of my power. He made them take a step back and get down on their knees. And then in verse number seven, he says, I'm going to ask you again, who are you looking for? And they respond with the same phrase, Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, if I have five more minutes, we could talk about the foolishness of worldly living. He just showed them, I'm not just a normal man. I'm not just your average Joe. <laughs> I'm not just a regular guy. I'm the God man. Oh, oh, oh I, I, I may look a certain way on the exterior, but let me go ahead and show you who I really am. I am. I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to show it. I'm going to make you get down on one knee in my presence. Because there will be a time, I wish Paul was here, that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. And I wish the Jehovah Witness could hear me right now. Confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He showed them, oh, I'm in charge. I, I, I'm, I'm definitely running things here. So I'm going to ask you, one more again. I'm going to say it that way. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more again. I'm going to give you one more chance. I, I've showed you my power. I've showed you I'm in charge. I'm going to give you another chance to get this thing right. Who are you looking for? I really believe that we shouldn't be overly critical of this mob of individuals. Because if we can just be honest, you ain't got to say nothing. 
But guess what? We've all been there. I know I have. I, I, I raised my hand. Maybe you don't want to tell your little situation. But hasn't God shown us in certain ways that the course that you are going is wrong? He's shown us. Stop it. He's shown his power. Stop it. He's blessed you and you took that blessing and you squandered it. And he said, all right now, you better stop that. And guess what? We went and we did the same thing again. This is the foolishness of worldly living. Like, like, like a woman who has been in a bad relationship and, and an abusive relationship. And God blessed you. Bless you by allowing him after all you put up with, after all of the indignities you had to suffer, after all of the disrespect, and you still tried to cling to a bad man. God blessed you by making him leave. He found somebody else and to add insult to injury, he left you. That's your blessing right there. But what happened? Sometimes we go right back to that same bad man again or right back into that same bad relationship again. What about you people who've had a job, a good job, paid you good money, had good benefits, and you got fired? Why? Because you came late, you left early. You said you were sick and you're on Facebook somewhere taking a vacation. You lost your job. Now you had to struggle to make ends meet and struggle to find another job. And savings are gone. And when you finally get back on your feet and God blesses you sometime even with a better job, guess what you start doing then? Being late again, taking late lunches again, taking smoke breaks again. The same thing that you just came out of and he showed you the error of your ways. You need to stop it. And as soon as you get back on your feet, now you're financially independent again. Now you start wasting money again. Friend, we've all been there. We have all been there. So as we look at these soldiers who were forced to go backward and take a knee and God gave them another chance, you would have think they would have said, hey, hey, listen, I'm out of here. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Lord, I don't know what I was thinking. They said, oh, no, 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 no. We're still looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says in verse number eight, I've told you I'm he. I'm the one. If you seek me, which I believe I'm the one you're looking for, don't touch these. This is verse number eight. Don't touch these. Just, just let them go their way. Now, now, first of all, he could have left them on their knees and just walked away. And they would have just been powerless to stop it. He could have made them go on their knees and they could have died. He could have taken their life. You got a whole mob of dead people. But he put them on their knees, allowed them to get back on their feet. And he said, now I'm giving you a choice. Choose you this day. You got two choices. You can continue in your foolishness or you can go home and let it all go. They still continued in their stubborn, hard-headed, and foolish ways. And they said, we're looking for Jesus. And then in verse 8, Jesus said, well, listen, since you're going to take me, I'm the one you want. Let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled in verse number 9, of them which thou hast given to me, I have lost none of them. That comes from John chapter 17, his, his high priestly prayer. How in the world can Jesus be, in their eyes, a common criminal and then dictate who they take into custody and who they let go? You, you, you're not running the shot here. Well, that's the belief that's wrong. He is running the show. He said, take me, but you ain't touching these. Another display of his power, showing that he's the master of the moment. He is in complete control. And then we get to verse number 10. Then Simon Peter, he don't have that sword for nothing. It wasn't a sword like a long sword, like something we'll see on some medieval movies, a, a, a Game of Thrones. It was more a dagger. He had a switchblade, we would say that all the time. He pulls out his, his knife 
And he smote the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. Now, wait a minute, Peter. Peter is trying to protect Jesus. And kudos to Peter for being impulsive, for acting when others are freezing up. But Peter is fighting with the wrong weapon. Peter is fighting with a physical sword. God does not want us to use a physical sword to defend ourselves. The weapons, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We don't fight fire with fire. I don't argue with a foolish person because somebody's going to walk by and not know who the fool is. I'm not going to go fist to cuff with some young person, some other man over some nonsense. I'm going to defend myself. Amen, Pastor Smith. But I'm not going to go fist to cuff with foolish people. Why? We don't fight fire with fire. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal because in this army, in God's army, this is the only army that marches into battle on their knees. I can't tell you the amount of times that people have thought they had the one up on me. But when I went down in prayer, God can do what no man can stop. When God opens a door, you can't shut it. When God closes a door, you can't open it. If God says it, it's going to come to pass. But Peter is relying on his own strength and he's using the wrong weapon. He had a sword and he drew it. He smoked, he cut, he struck the high priest servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now this is instructive on this regard. Peter not only is using the wrong weapon, Peter is fighting the wrong enemy. Malchus, although he's carrying out foolish, evil mandates and orders, Malchus was not his enemy. Malchus was the servant of the high priest. The high priest sent Malchus and Peter not only is using the wrong weapon, he's fighting the wrong enemy. Malchus was not his enemy. Truth be told, the high priest was not their enemy. The real enemy works behind the scenes. The real enemy is clandestine. He works in the shadows. The real enemy is not pastor so-and-so. It's not reverend so-and-so. It ain't brother or sister so-and-so. It ain't your in-laws that have turned into outlaws. It ain't your boss. The real enemy is the enemy of the church. And he uses us to hurt God. He orchestrates situations so that we can fail and that we can suffer because his war is actually against our savior. But how many people know we are fighting a defeated foe? It's foolish to get in church. Ain't talking to this person. Ain't talking to that person. This family don't like that family and this side of the church don't like that side of the church and this mama and daddy and their kids don't like that mama and daddy and their kids and the morale in the church gets low. The attendance in the church get low. The sacrificial giving in the church gets low and guess what? The church implodes from the inside. Why? Because we think the person across the aisle is the real enemy. Yes, there are people who can do foolish things, mean things, cruel and cold hearted things. And the Bible gives prescriptions on how to deal with them in the church. But make no mistake about it. As it relates to us, as it relates to Peter, Malchus was not his enemy at all. The real enemy is behind the scenes. And when we look at Luke's account of this situation, Luke 22 and verse 55 Luke, verse 51, excuse me. Jesus tells Luke, Jesus tells Peter, excuse me, put away your sword. And he took Malchus' ear and he touched it. In other words, he said, Peter, 
puts your sword back. He goes to Malchus and puts his ear back. Now think about that. He healed one of the soldiers that was sent there to arrest him who was going to carry him away to illegal trials that eventually is going to lead to his crucifixion. Because when the pressure was on, the real character of a person comes out. When the pressure is on, the real character inside someone displays itself. When the pressure is on, you find out what's underneath the hood and you find out what you're really made of. When the pressure is on, you find out who you are and in many cases who you are not as it relates to Christ. Can you imagine if Jesus did not heal Malchus? Can you imagine the story he would have to tell as people got close to him and they began to talk to him and he could be informal with them and maybe confide a little bit, you know. Malchus, I guess you must have been at war and maybe fighting in some foreign land with the Roman army and that's a battle wound. Oh no, it's no battle wound. Well, surely you were in some kind of a sword fight, some life and death situation. No, 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 nothing like that. Well, if you don't mind telling me, Malchus, what, what happened to your ear? What why is it scarred and deformed in such a way? Well, it was a Christian. Matter of fact, it was a preacher. A man named Peter took out his sword and cut me as I was there to arrest Jesus. Do you know what Peter, had it not been for Christ, do you know what Peter would have been? He would have been a disgrace to grace. And let me tell you something. When you are in the church and you work in the church, and I know I'm talking to somebody who has experienced this, there is no hurt like a church hurt. There is no pain like the pain that comes from the ones that are closest to you. There is no pain like the pain you have when the ones who should be supporting you and helping you are the ones who are tearing you down, the ones who are maligning your name, there's no hurt that you can feel like the hurt that you get when it comes from fellow members of Christ, from somebody that's supposed to know better. When you look at them, when you experience what you experience in the church, there are many people who are a disgrace to grace. There are some people who they can't sleep good unless they are a part directly or indirectly of some confusion some nasty situation, some nasty turmoil in the church. They can't sleep good unless it's a mess going on. Jesus saved not only the ear of Malchus, he also saved the testimony of Peter. He healed the ear of Malchus. He told Peter, put away your sword. And we know how he said it. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So what happened to Jesus? He used his power and blinded them with light and they went away. No, he allowed them to take him into custody. John chapter 10 and 18. No man has taken my life, but I'm giving my life. I'm willingly lay it down myself. Because when I lay it down, I've got the power three days later to pick it up again. He allowed the soldiers to get back on their feet and to continue coming to him. He allowed Malchus to come to him and to arrest him. He allowed Malchus to be in that situation. He healed his ear, ear and he rebuked Peter and he allowed them to take him away. Carried him from judgment hall to judgment hall. And guess what they did, friend? They crucified him. They scourged him beforehand. Pilate said the words, I'm going to scourge him and then let him go. Trying to present to them a bloody Jesus. Now he was truthful to the first part. He scourged him, but he wasn't truthful to the second part. He didn't let him go. He brought a bloody Jesus and put Barabbas on the other side. Choose who do you want? 
They said, give us Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. It's so fitting how Christ said he came. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. They beat him, spat on him, scourged him, pulled the hair from his beard, put a robe around him and blindfolded him, punched him in the face and said, since you're a prophet, prophesy to us. Who hit you? They made him carry his cross. Rising and falling to Calvary Hill, the place of skull. Some say it's called the place of skull because it's a mound that looks like a skull. Others say because that's where they crucified many people and there were skulls laying around. In either case, it's a place of death. They lifted him high after they nailed his hands and put a sign over his head that said, in essence, you were looking for a king. Here is the king of the Jews. And even his enemies, these religious leaders, they still didn't like that. They said, take that sound down, that sign down. Don't say he's the king of the Jews. Put on there that he says he's the king of the Jews. And then here comes Pilate, a day late and a dollar short, now trying to have some backbone. He said, what I have written, I have written. Well, Pilate, you're a day late and a dollar short. You should have had that type of backbone at the very beginning. But God knew these things would come to pass. He hung on Calvary's cross from the sixth until the ninth hour. And they put a platform under your feet. And the reason they did that was so that you would be tortured while you hung there. The loss of blood and body fluid made you weak. And when your body would slump down, it would put pressure on the nails in your hand. But you also had a nail in your feet and you would push up on that plank and it would put pressure then on your feet. And as you go up and down on that wooden cross, all of the open wounds from being scourged and scourged and turned your back into a heap of raw flesh. All that flesh and wounds would go up and down on the wood. And you would hang there and eventually you would die from suffocation. You become too weak to uh, breathe. Your lungs would fill with fluid. It would be like what we would consider being waterboarded to where you would be drowning. In this case, drowning in your own bodily fluids. And friends, he died. That story alone. If that don't make you want to go to Sunday school. If that don't get you up to go to church. If that don't motivate you to serve the Lord, to honor the Lord, to honor him with a piece of what he's given to you. If that don't move you, friend, nothing can and nothing will. If it's a song, I'm sorry, I'm not finna sing. If it's theatrics, I'm sitting in this chair. I'm not getting up and dancing for the crowd. But if the fact that he died and suffered for your sins and mine, if that don't move you, I don't know what will. That is the essence of the gospel. You have people whose devotion to Christ is so weak. If you had church in their living room, they wouldn't come out the bedroom to be a part of it. In the face of a God that has suffered so greatly. He did die. But it's the bad news that makes the good news good. Because early that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. That's why we worship on Sunday. The first day of the week, early that Sunday morning, not the Sabbath. The Sabbath was Saturday. The Lord's day is the first day of the week. Early that Sunday morning, he rose from the grave. And friends, he's alive and well. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And if you want to know what he's doing on our behalf until he comes back, read the book of Hebrews. It tells you how he's acting as a high priest on our behalf. He's coming back again. And for the people who are living like you ain't going to die one day, when you forsake and disrespect your mother and father, when you lie and malign on your brother and your sister, when you treat your wife or your husband badly, when you don't honor God at the church, when you feel like you've done God a favor because you show up at church on Sunday twice in a row, to the people that are living like they ain't going to die again, he's coming back. 
And will you be ready? Well, how can I get ready? Well, for the unclean, for the one who's saved, and your life has gotten off track, God has a word for you. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just to the unclean, but to the unsaved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart the biblical account that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Salvation is not because you preach, because you pastor, because you're in ministry, because you go to church. Salvation is because you believe what the Bible says about Christ suffering and paying the price for your sin. And it causes you to repent. Lord, I'm sorry. This is not the life for me. I want to change. Come into my heart. Change me. Friend, before your body, your mind sends a signal to your nervous system and your muscles and you stand up and walk down the aisle, you are saved already. Let me encourage you on this Easter Sunday to thank the Lord for dying for our sins. He didn't have to do it, but I'm so glad that he did. I won't go on any further. I think we've done enough, done enough to go over this chapter and these verses. But let me tell you, New Hebron, and to all those paying attention, I thank the Lord for you. I hope something has been encouraging, um, inspiring, enlightening, and I hope that something has been said to press us along as we get closer to Christ. God bless you, and Lord willing, we'll see you again next week.